Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh, yeah, somebody wants me. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Heights, and also the founder and owner of Prep Athletics. We've got a great episode today. Uh, it's the head coach from Phillips Exeter Academy, boys basketball team, Coach Jay Tilton. And on this show, we're going to discuss what it's like to play at a school like Exeter, his thoughts on playing in the Ivy League, and how he chooses player players, getting them off to college, and much, much more. And Coach Tilton's been at Exeter for over 11 years, and has coached players who have gone on to all levels of college basketball. His most notable player is current NBA player and Miami, Miami Heat star Duncan Robinson. And Exeter is one of the most recognized prep schools across the globe. It sits on a beautiful campus in southern New Hampshire, which you can, if you're watching this on YouTube, can see the new athletic center uh, projected behind Jay. So Jay, welcome very much to the uh, program. Corey, thank you for having me. It's a real pleasure to be part of this uh, you and Prep Athletics have been a, a godsend for our program here. So I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come on and chat today. Yeah, just to fill everyone in on our relationship, we've known each other probably, I don't know, seven or eight years now. And we've actually connected on two players, Kyle Copeland, who came to you for a postgrad year and ended up at Holy Cross. And then Tony Rochak, who uh, came there for a postgrad program from Switzerland, uh, played two years at Regis University here in Denver, and then actually did the Duncan Robinson where he bumped up uh, to the D1 level. And last year he had a great first season at UC San Diego. So we've connected on two players. Uh, we'll get into them a little bit later and kind of their experience. But um, before we start on that, when you were a kid growing up, first of all, where did you grow up? And of all the sports that were out there, why did you gravitate towards basketball? I grew up in, in New Hampshire. I'm pretty much a New England guy through and through, except in my stint, uh, uh, in college, but I, I grew up in Berlin, New Hampshire, which is actually the no northern part of New Hampshire. It's, it's technically closer to the Canadian border than it is Exeter. <laughs> New Hampshire is not a big state, um, but I, I'm the uh, product of educators. My parents were involved in public school educating for a long time. And my father's uh, retired now, but he coached both basketball and football for over 40 years. So it's you know, it's been in my blood. I've uh, you know, just raised in a, in a household where sort of coaching and parenting were synonymous. Uh, um, and that's, a, you know, clearly my my parents have been a big influence. Well, a lot of other coaching mentors, but you know, they are a big influence on doing what I what I do now. Gotcha. And then you started your your high school career. You started playing basketball and, and, and everything in a public school in New Hampshire. And then you made the transition to New Hampton, which is one of the more uh, well-known basketball prep schools in the country. What, what was that conversation like and what, what prompted that move? Yeah, I, I did three years at the, at the public school that I was at, public high school, again, with my parents being uh, heavily you know, influential education and I have two older three older siblings but two who actually attended postgraduate years which uh, in the community I was in that was a, a rarity it wasn't something that people knew that much about it really came out of um, an influence from my father who you know we spent back then AAU wasn't much of a thing it was all the, the summer camps for various sports is what we all did and that's where sort of the, the college networking took place at these camps. And I think that's, that's where we were introduced as a family to this idea of, of what a postgraduate year could do uh, for, for, you know, various reasons, both academically and uh, athletically and socially too. So that was something we kind of, you know, dipped the toes in the water with my siblings doing that. And they had such good experiences. Uh, one ironically went to New Hampton, the other went to Exeter. Uh, so I kind of followed in those footsteps, uh, um, as we went down that path, it was my turn and I had made the decision or we had as a family that I would give this a two year run to do the reclass year, which is becoming a more popular thing as I was getting to that, that age range. Um, and I, I took a look at the New Hampton school. I really liked what that was. I felt for me at the time was the appropriate fit relative to where I was as a, as a young man and kind of figuring, figuring it all out. 
uh, unbeknownst to me when I was interviewing there, my father was also uh, interviewing for a for a position as a teacher and coach there. So they, they broke that one to me about a week later after I had my, my uh, acceptance letter there. So it ended up being a, uh, a terrific move. You know, our, our whole family transitioned there. And um, it was a, a great opportunity for me to, to gain a whole new realm of life experiences at New Hampton. And it's just a terrific community, much smaller than, than what we have at Exeter in terms of, you know, the large, the student body, but it was so formative in, in all the decisions that I made moving forward in my career in education. So I, I hold a, a real you know, warm place in my heart for that experience and the people I, I met you know, at, at New Hampton. Did your dad get the job there? He did. He did. Oh, yeah. That's great. So, he ended your... up being, so I'm sorry. He ended up being my assistant. Um, he was the assistant coach on the basketball team and, and football as well, which are two sports that I was involved in at that, that point. But Whit Shore, who is a, who's a, as you know, well, is, is a legend in the prep school scene from Bridgeton Academy, uh, was my coach when I moved to, uh, you know, the prep school world. Um, so, I mean, he was highly instrumental in, in sort of you know, my transformation as a player and, and also wanted to become a coach. Um, it was great to sort of expand on that experience that, that he afforded me. And, and, of course, having the opportunity to play for both Wit and my father, and then having some other coaches in football, it was just it was just a broader perspective for me as a young man coming out of Northern New Hampshire. I you know, I didn't really know which way was up at that point. Um, it was a really sort of insular environment that I was in at, at that stage growing up. So again, it just expanded my my worldly view of academics, socially. Um, you just having the opportunity to really see some different paths that were out there. And, uh, you know, Wit was a big part of that. So I'm, I'm forever grateful. Were you there during the Pat Knight years by chance? Pat played for my, uh, my father, um, not long after I left okay. and, and Wit had transitioned to a different job. Um, he, he got into the college ranks about the same time I was in college. Uh, but Pat did play for my father and, and you know, we, we ended up establishing a, a friendship through that and had a chance to kind of get to know his father a little bit and, um, you know, still, still friends with Pat today, but yeah, he, he was a, he was a, a really good player back then. Um, that was a really good team he played on. Ironically, I don't know if you, if you knew something about Conzo Martin was also a member of that team. Sure. Yeah. Um, so there was, it was interesting. They had a lot of really good players that that are well known now for various you know, roles they have in basketball that started out you know taking a chance on doing something different out of their comfort zone and going to prep school and then from there you went to Hobart College I did yes and then you mentioned you got injured when you first got there correct yeah I did I was actually just chatting about that with a friend yesterday because we were eyeballing some outdoor courts that looked like they'd be good to play on and I remembered the mistake I made playing on an outdoor court in the weekend, you know, outside of our, our freshman workouts. And that was, I had two, two ACL uh, tears during a short period of time I was there. At that point, I'd been injury free, but, you know, it, as much as at that point, um, it was challenging kind of like sort of being, feeling like you're stripped of the identity that you had built for so long as a young man as a basketball player and you know I wasn't a I wasn't a high level recruit by any stretch but it was something I always identified with and and that, that level of connectivity with teams was always important to me so um, when my playing career really kind of detoured um, from injury I I recognized pretty quickly that I didn't want to get away from it mm -hmm. um, and just the, the 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 benefit of being connected like that being part of something bigger than myself was something I was not ready to get away from. Um, and it really sort of to, you know, influence my direction with wanting to be a coach. Um, I think I always wanted to have that as part of my being just because of, you know, what, what I grew up in, but that really affirmed the direction I wanted to go. And, and um, I had no aspirations at that point of being a, a college coach. It was really just figuring out what's the next step after, after college, could I get a high school job somewhere? And, or maybe a prep school because I had valued that experience so much. But you know, it was a turning point for me, um, having an injury. And fortunately, I, I will say this, and, and I will give a lot of credit to both, again, Coach LaShore and my father in choosing the school I went to. One of the things they said, and I didn't want to think of it at the time, is 
picture where you'd be happy if basketball wasn't part of the equation. Um, don't make your decisions solely on basketball in case you get injured or you have a change of heart or, you know, what have you, you get cut, <laughs> new coach, things happen. Um, so, you know, I did take that advice to heart. And Holbrook was a really good fit for me in lots of different ways. So, you know, when I, when I did have to make some changes and, and sort of where my identity was at that point, it was still in a really good spot where I could thrive. Um, so it was, it was a good decision in hindsight. Is that still advice you give to your players today when they're making college decisions? All the time, mm -hmm. <laughs> all the time, uh, whether they're coming in to Exeter or on the exit side of going off to college. And we, I always talk about, you know, Clearly basketball is going to play an enormous part of your experience, but it may not always be as uh, what you envision. Uh, those things change uh, from, from day to day. And if you don't have, have, it's not, I don't want to say necessarily the backup plan, but looking, it's more like looking at the big picture um, and realizing what experience you want. It's a, it's a key question I ask every one of my kids when we're starting to talk about, I say my kids, my players, because I, do think of them as my kids too but as as we start talking about their recruiting process post exeter it's you know quickly they they will tell me i want to be i want to play the highest level or i want to play i know i want to play at x y or z and i and i always caution put the brakes on a bit let's let's talk about what experience you want to have what what what's your what's your ideal college experience look like you know including basketball and outside of it and, and invariably a lot of them describes something that's very different than what they say they want in name. Um, and that's something I just want to challenge them to really understand and, and dig, you know, dig deeper on that one, take a deeper dive and really understand what it is you're asking for and what you're and what you're guiding yourself towards. So you want to end up in a situation where you're going to thrive, not just athletically, but, you know, socially and academically, it's got to be a good fit because, you know, things happen and you got to be able to, as I, as I said to you a, a, a little earlier, you got to be able to sometimes just read the defense and pivot. And um, you had to make sure you're in a good spot for that and have the right support system for in case that does happen. Yeah. And we're, you know, I was going to get to this later, but with all the transferring happening now, are you finding kids that have gone through your program? Are they, are you having any that are transferring now? And is it, is it because of the reason you just mentioned that they did pick the right school, no matter who the coach is or what the situation is in the basketball court or, What's going on with yeah. your alumni on that? Well, we've, we've been really fortunate, I think. And part of it is you know, our kids have chosen schools that are, you know, they've taken a, a, a wider approach mindset to places they're going. It hasn't just been about basketball. We've had a, a few that have transferred, but not many. Uh, so the pandemic hasn't really affected that so much in terms of where our kids are collegiately. Um, so we're happy about that. But, you know, again, I, I think it, it's being prepared to, to pivot if you have to and thinking broadly about it uh, helps as well. But I think on the, on the front end of it, we've, our kids have done a really nice job. We put it this way, we have a lot more kids who are ended up being captains of their teams in college than they have transferred by, by a long shot. Um, so, but, you know, that transfer thing right now, it's a hot topic. There's a lot of things going on. There's, you know, there's well over a thousand kids in the portal right now. Uh, the trickle down effect on, on our current kids and future kids. Um, it's, it's evident and starting to think broadly about how we're going to, uh, how that's going to affect us and how we can help kids in the, those situations at our schools. Let's get into that right now. So with COVID going on, with the transfers going on, how has getting your kids placed at the next level, has it changed in this past uh, 18 months? It, it has, and that's something we're being proactive in looking at now. I think the real struggle um, is, you know, in, in, the, in the immediate situation that we're in in the past you know, six to eight months has been really challenging for the 2020 and 21s has been a real challenge, particularly with you know, the high school kids for a lot of them. They haven't been seen uh, live since last February or March. That's a lot of kids fall into that category. Uh, um, and unfortunately, the NCAA's changes and rules have not benefited that that population either. You know, you've got you got a lot of kids in the transfer portal who don't have to uh, sit out a year. Um, you got the opportunity for a lot of schools to to retain players for an additional year. 
that is really forced, put a lot of pressure on, on the high school kids. Uh, I didn't say that it's put pressure on coaches to make decisions in different ways. Um, and as, as you know, it's such an information business and much of there's so much sort of fluff involved in that, that at the end of the day, coaches really want to see kids play live. Mm-hmm. They want to get the games early. They want to see how kids warm up. They want to see how they, how they interact with each other, with their coaches, with officials and, you, know, you can't get that from a highlight film. You know, you want to see how kids rotate on defense. There's just so much you can't take from the superficial parts of, of recruitment. But I think, unfortunately, for most high school kids, that's all that's available right now. Um, and there is some AAU activity going on right now that's helpful. But again, very little of it um, is is live. Uh, and it's certainly not for, for scholarship level coaches. Yeah, and... Um... <laughs> But th- let me ask you this: a Previous podcast, we've had other New England prep school coaches frustrated mm-hmm. because they've been doing this so long, like your Whit- Whitlejures, like your Jerry Quins, who have placed kids in the past and who are going to be doing this for the foreseeable future, and they have a track record, just like you do. Mm-hmm. And when you call a coach up and say, "Guy, uh, this player could work at your school; he's he's a great fit," and they pause on that, that's got to be frustrating because you know that this kid is going to succeed. They're going to have a chance and you're, you're not going to blow them up and, and try to put them at a level. He's not going to succeed at. So, so to me, talking to guys like yourself across the prep school world, trying to place these kids, I just sense frustration over and over again. that There seems to be a lack of trust on what you guys are offering these programs. Yeah, I, 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 I understand that. I would say we, we've been pretty fortunate in that regard where, you know, our kids have landed in some really good places com- coming out of their year at Exeter. Um, and, you know, they're, again, looking more broadly at what the experience they wanted has helped. They're all going to really high, you know, selective academic situations that they, they wanted from the get-go. So that, that's, that's helped a lot. That's mm-hmm. first, first and foremost, I think that's what's driving the process. Um, so I'm really happy in terms of their, their current landing spots for this class we've had. Um, but I, you know, I, the, I will say that going through this, as long as I have here, this is my you know 19th year in totality at Exeter and had, had several years at the, at the ID coaching level, that collective experience in terms of placement of our kids, it, it has so much more to do with uh, years past, not this, not just this past year, but I think we've done a pretty good job of making sure that we're helping kids choose the right schools from the get-go, not trying to fit them into, you know, round round pegs into square holes. So there is a been a there there has been some longevity to that trust factor, um, as you mentioned, some of those other coaches. So I, I, at the end of the day, I do think those coaches are going to continue to shop at the places they've had good luck you know, where they felt that I know a kid coming out of program X, Y, or Z is going to give me this, you know, they're going to be academically well-prepared. They're going to be, um, you know, socially, they've already had you know, a number of years away from home. So that transition component is not something we have to worry about. Uh, they played at a high level. That's a big part right now is a lot of kids are sending me film. They look pretty good, but they're not playing against very much. So those kids now get put in the back burner because um, they just coaches just don't have the right evaluation tools. Um, so I, I think being consistent as a coach at this level in our messaging to college coaches and, and doing a good job with them while they're here and not overselling um, and, you know, overproducing has probably been the, the best message for any any coach at this level of that'll help really benefit players now that are trying to get to that next level. Cause they do have an uphill battle. There's no question. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Has this changed what kind of player you go after now that you have to place them in this new environment? Uh, For, for, for Exeter, probably, I, I, you know, I don't want to say no, never. Uh, We have, we certainly have a certain type of, young man that we we believe will thrive in this environment first and foremost they have to thrive in this environment before they can thrive in the next one so i in that regard no i i I won't change what we do um because you you have to really before you can do something 
at the next stop, you have to do a great job at the place you're at. So again, I have to make sure we have kids that are going to thrive in this environment at Exeter. And, and that's, that's not going to change much based on the pandemic. Does it mean that our process will be different in identification? Probably, you know, I, I have to take stock of that. Um, I'll tell you this, uh, um, and I, I predicted this is not like I'm Nostradamus here or anything. It's not that hard to figure out, but the trickle down effect of players looking for prep school now it's every day, every day I'm getting flooded with more and more talented kids who in the past wouldn't be looking at this route, but they don't really have other options. And unfortunately, a lot of kids have waited too long uh, and, and the prep schools have, have a lot to choose from now. It's kind of fish in a barrel for a lot of places. Um, so there are, there are a lot of kids, I think, right now who are faced with some tough situations just trying to find where that spot's going to be next year if it's not college um so that's that's been a little bit challenging but i, I think i think my recruitment and identification of players is going to happen even earlier than it typically does mm. uh, we tend to be as a, just by nature of what our school is and our uh, admissions uh expectations we're usually on the front end anyway but now i'm thinking it's going to be even earlier um and Sooner than later, it's, it's you know, again, we're not just a postgraduate program, but I, I anticipate a lot of the 2023s and 24s are going to start really thinking soon. I'm going to have to consider something quicker than I normally would and making a change to, to get some, buy some more time to, to push past this issue we have with, with the uh, NCAA and that, that bubble we have of um, the transfer portal. Yeah, and I've said it before, I'll say it again. And reclassing or doing a postgrad year is an is insurance plan to buy you more time to see how everything shakes out, right? And if I am going to a place like yours or Wits or Jerry's, uh, I've got guys like you that are connected at every level who have my back, where maybe a normal AAU coach or a high school coach does not have those connections. So that's what a selling point is for you. Speaking of selling points, give me your pitch. I mean, I I tell people and people come up to me all the time and ask me about, you know, prep schools they know, or we talk about basic prep schools and a couple words always, a couple always come up is IMG Academy, uh, Brewster and Exeter and Hillcrest prep is always thrown in there too. Cause of Deandre Dayton. And obviously we both know they're not a prep school, but that name always pops up. So you guys have um, a giant global brand name. If I'm a player looking at a couple schools and Exeter is one of them, what is your pitch? Why should I come to your school? Well, that's one, that's pretty elite company to be part of. So thank you for, for mentioning that. Um, I'm not sure we belong there or not, but I appreciate the pitch. Um, you know, I, the thing that I love about the, the prep school experience for, for athletes is that, you know, every one of these places, like the ones you just mentioned, they all serve a specific need for a specific kit. Um, I don't think you can look at choosing prep schools in a vacuum. They're all very different and offer different um, strengths and, and programs that a student may thrive in. And for a kid that'll thrive at one place, it, it may not be the right thing at, at Exeter. It could be the same. I mean, it, it, but at the end of the day, our schools offer so much um, but they are very different in, in, in their own right. Exeter is forever has been known as a, you know, a, a real, it's an incredible academic school. Um, it, it has been long before I was part of it and will be long afterwards. I think in my time, I'll, I'll be a blip on the radar screen here, but, um, our basketball program is in a, in a place where we can compete uh, at a pretty high level. We have, we have, uh, it's, it's a, college prep program, you know, 80, 90% of our kids that are playing, we'll, we'll be playing at the next level somewhere. Um, but alongside of that, they are going to get that incredible academic experience. Uh, it's, it's not for the faint of academic heart. I'll tell you that they work at it, you know? So we're, we're looking for that kid who is um, equally as interested in, in, in their, their academic experience here they have to be first and foremost so if they're not then we're moving on it's just not a situation that it's even worth investing time in um in a thrive at a school like exeter you, you have to have that that balance and you have to um, really want both of those things so for me one of my evaluating tools here is 
sure, academically, you have to be the right kind of kid, uh, but they also have to love basketball um, because they, I know they have, they're going to have to schedule their day in a way that they're going to have to um, say no to a lot of things, uh, mostly social uh, time to fit it in what they want to do. But the type of schools that typically our kids are moving on to play at, that's what they're doing at that level. So going back to that, that point I made earlier, what kind of experience do you want to have? The one that, that most of them are describing is the exact same one they have here. It's, it's um, so that is able to help them to say, okay, well then these are the type of schools where you can find that. So I'll continue to recruit kids like that. Um, and again, I, I think some of the strengths of our, our, what our school thrives on is, you know, in addition to, to kids who have a proven ability to do well academically in their current environment, they, they're really good communicators. That's a, a big part of our teaching pedagogy here is it's, it's all student generated discussion. So you have to have kids who, who are, are really interested in learning with and from others. It's an incredibly diverse uh, student body that we have here. And, and so kids who can come in, come in and, and um, excited about learning in that environment do well here. And, those are good kids to, to, to coach. They're great kids to coach in that regard too. Yeah. Now, besides being coach, you also work in the admissions department there. Correct. And to me, my favorite coaches to work with are coaches that work in the admission department because you guys know on a day-to-day -day basis uh, how much financial aid is left. And I know you're a different situation with financial aid, but how much financial aid is left, how many spots are still open, what needs or boxes you need to be checked. Uh, what advantage is giving you um, does it give you as a coach to be in the admission office throughout your recruitment of players? I think it's just, a, it's, it's not so much an advantage as a coach. Um, you know, I'm always careful, but I don't want people to think, I, I never want people to think that any of our players are here because of my influence in admissions, because it's not the case. Um, they all have the operates. It's a really, um, it's the process is, is an equal opportunity for everybody. So I, I don't have an opportunity. I would not be in a situation where I would be pushing for them from the inside. Um, but the way it works, I, I think the advantage and advantage of nice head is just a real understanding of what kind of kid thrives at this school. Uh, that's, that's a really, and then I think for any admissions officer or whatever school they're working at, they're going to have sort of the inside real strong knowledge of that because that by nature is what your job is is to identify students who will thrive in that particular environment so that's that's part of the the uh the core of what the job entails so that has really helped me i didn't get that entirely when i first took the job here coming as a college coach you know at that point i just said okay find a kid with a good transcript who can play right and figured that pl plug and play situation not the case it's not exactly the case. I turn away I, a lot of kids who probably could qualify or at least be, you know, would be competitive in the pool here. But again, it's really understanding what kid would thrive in this environment is the most important part. And I think my job in admissions has afforded me the opportunity to kind of get to know that a bit. Um, and it helps kind of guide some of the decisions I make and who I want to kind of put, you know, put a stamp on for kids I want to recruit. Well, the reason I think it's such a good advantage for you to have working in that office and knowing the conversations going on is that I deal with some prep school coaches that are at, in, are, are, at odds, are at odds all the time with their admission offices. They can't get the package they want for a kid. Um, and it's just, it, it is a disconnect there. You know, a family says they can pay 30. And then when the letter comes out, oh, you got to pay 60 and the coach is furious because that's not what they presented. So my point is like you being in that position, you're going to, there's going to be no misinformation and, and you're in the office. A lot of coaches, you know, have issues with. So, and it's not every coach, but just, I, I just, I just joke with the coaches I work with. I was like, Hey, this would not be a problem if you moved over from being AD or, you know, teaching English to the admissions department, then you would know how the sausage is made and you could have some more input that way. So I just think you and your uh, compatriots that work in admissions just have a, a really, there's just no surprises. That's one of the things as well. So. Well, this is such a unique situation here too, Corey, is that, you know, we're, we're in a, such a, a fortunate place. And I'm really grateful for this is that, you know, Exeter guarantees to meet need. 
of our of all students. Yeah, explain so, that a little bit for people. That's that's a that's yeah. a great thing you offer. Yeah. Well, it's 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 our our admission policy here for financial aid. It's it's all strictly need based. There's no merit money here. So on the front end of it, um, the the goal of the institution is to have families make their decision if 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 they if they are fortunate enough to be offered an opportunity to come here. They don't want the decision to be made. Um, based on finances. Now, there's no, um, th again, there's no merit money and in, in, they're not extending beyond what parents um, qualify for by any stretch, but the idea, but there is enough that we don't have, the, the budget's robust enough that we can offer that for every student that's, that, that applies for financial aid and has demonstrated need here. So it, it's, look, it's a real advantage. I'm very fortunate to be in that situation. Uh, now there are other there are other drawbacks as well in terms of of, of it being super competitive in, in terms of the admission process here that I'm sure others would not like to deal with. But at least from the financial side, um, that is something where uh, I feel really good about for all of our students here is that you know if 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 this is a place that that you have a chance to come to, and you're a student of need, that we're able to help match that demonstrated need. Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great benefit you guys have. Let me ask you this. You Let's get back to your college coaching days. So you coached at Dartmouth. How many years were you there? Four years. Okay. When you were there, what did you learn that is now helping you as a prep school coach? And is there any kind of behind the scenes intel that on the Ivy League that students could could hear that might help them? If they're like early in the process, like ninth and 10th grade, is there anything you can tell them if they want to go the Ivy League route that might help them potentially get that way? Well, I think some of the most important things I learned from college coaching was, I'm not joking when I say this, doing laundry, uniforms on the road, <laughs> doing setting up meals, uh, you know, all of the dirty work that goes behind college coaching. Mm. It's not what you see on Saturday when you're watching the games on TV. You know, understanding what it really means to um, to help run that type of an organization from that role. I started my first year, I was a volunteer. In the next three years, I was a full-time assistant. Uh, but what I learned from just sort of the grassroots part of the program, how it operates, uh, is what you know, I think most of the public eye wouldn't, wouldn't identify with. So for me, in this role now as a coach... <laughs> I have a great appreciation for the people who are supporting our program in that regard. And I think that's a really important thing to build your culture of your program is to show some appreciation for those, all those different roles that people play in it. Um, I look at my coaching staff here as being about 50 people. <laughs> now mm -hmm. they may not be sitting on the bench with me, but we can't do what we, don't, what we have done here without the role that they've played from anywhere from our equipment managers to, you know, assistant ADs to some faculty that have been very supportive of the program. So I think that's one of the biggest things I learned in college coaching is how many people are actually involved in do, having to do their, their role well to make the whole thing go on Saturday night. Um, so, you know, but in terms of my own personal training, um, that film exchange component of what we did back then was, is very different than now. I mean, it was back, you know, 20, 20, between 20, 25 years ago when I was at, at Dartmouth, uh, it was all VHS back then, and um, the film exchange basically entailed getting a VHS copy of a VHS film from every opponent we played from all of the teams they played non-conference. So you picture that's probably roughly 20 films that we had to get from every single team that we played that year. So 20, you know, whatever it was, 25 teams times 20. That's a lot of films. So it was a lot of sending stuff out and getting it back. And then it was, nothing was digital. It was all breaking it down at that point. So I spent a lot of time just looking at film and looking at film. That really helped kind of craft how I, the vision I had of how I might want to play someday if, mm -hmm. if I was to become a head coach. Um, I was in a really good situation at Dartmouth in terms of my mentors. I mean, Dave Fosher was, was the head coach when I was there. And I mean, he's just beyond just being an incredible man and, and friend now, I mean, I mean, he's just a, a phenomenal basketball coach and a lot of what he taught me uh, in terms of X's and O's in particular is part of what I, what I do now. You know, Mike Maker, who has had a, 
a real strong influence in the in, in successful run through college basketball was uh, the associate head coach there. So I got to sit and listen to them all the time, you know, and pay my dues, really just keep an ear open is what I did. They, they didn't need, they didn't need input from me. They just mm. needed an ear and needed me to do the, do the work I, I needed to do to support them. But I, those two large in part, I think really influenced how, um, how I wanted to play. I think at that point, I didn't really know. I didn't have much of an identity as a, as a coach X and O wise, but they're a, they're a big influence on that. And, you know, from there, I always joke and say everything that I do now, I, I'm not creative. I'm just really good at, at taking, stealing what other people do really well and try to give them credit for it and figure out how that fits what works well for the type of kid that, again, matches well with, with what we get at Exeter. Um, and that's been a, a nice blend for us is putting, the, putting those things together. So those are really big. Um, and, you know, to get to your other part of your question, like where, how do we help kids understand, like sort of getting to that next level, sort of part and parcel to where I came from. And this is sort of a seamless transition coming from a, an Ivy League school like Dartmouth to here. Um, it's, it's the same type of academic environment and, you know, progressive minded approach that, that people have to their education. So I think that, that, that helps to begin with. Um, but, it, you know, in coming here, what we typically do, if it's, if it's a postgraduate, I had this conversation with one of my kids that just committed a couple of days ago about, you know, what's he going to do for his, he's looking at his classes right now. Like, what am I going to take? And I got this, we offer 450 classes here. So it's like drinking out of a fire hose for a postgrad now trying to figure out what classes he's going to take. And, and I just said, Hey, let's slow down a little bit here. Let's step aside from the hose. Um, and why don't you just identify what things you're passionate about or things you think might be really interesting to you in your postgrad year. Cause one of the nice things about our, our postgrad structure here is that there's a, there's great flexibility in the year academically. Um, the courses are challenging, but there's less requirements. So it's really more about academic enrichment. So there's a lot of opportunities for them to, to take what they, what they want to, um, and what we think are going to help them down the road. So the first thing, step one was, you know, just let's, let's look at some, some things, some areas of growth that you and your family have identified are important to you. Um, and then the next piece is now let's, let's really talk to the experts here. Um, I'm not that guy in every area by any stretch. One thing I learned here that's really helped, helped me is, you know, don't pretend to know something you don't because someone else knows it better than you do. So you know, we get them in touch with our college counselors immediately. And for this young man, he's actually being recruited by a handful of, of, of IVs. And we said, let's take a look at your transcript. And, and, and once you've identified things you're interested in, let's really talk about what they're interested in mm. and let's see if, how, many of those, how many of those actually match each other. Then um, I put the trust in our college counseling office because they have just years of experience of, of understanding you know, where, where your holes might be in your transcript and how that relates to what these, these admissions offices are looking at. But I'll tell you one thing, the college coaches at the Ivy level, they're not the ones making a decision on your transcript. You know, they're, they, they, they know the range of what you need to be, but again, the admissions office is the one that knows the fit for the school and what they're looking for. So you have to match up all those, those different areas. Um, and then the last piece I use is just the, the capital we have here in our program the kids who have lived it, I get them matched up with them and say, Hey, what do you think of this schedule that I have? And I said, well, you're crazy to take that during the winter, during the hardest mm -hmm. part of the season, you might want to push that one to the spring. So, you know, we use all the different components that we, that the school uh, affords us here. Um, it's networking, it's networking beyond the basketball network, but that kind of goes back to my point of where I said, we, I have about 50 assistants here. I think that's, that's the support system we have. So, that's really how we get it started. Um, but, you know, as, as the year goes on, there's a, there's a lot of regular discussion about that experience that you described you want and how to help guide you toward it to see at the end of the day if, if it can become a reality in an Ivy League school. Yeah, let me ask you this. If you're on an Ivy League staff and you have two players that are exactly the same, right? So say it's their clones, right? 6'6", six, six, great shooters, great bodies same GPA, same SAT, 
but one kid's from a public school and one kid's from a, a, a bona fide prep school, you're almost going to have to take the prep school kid because he's already been away from home. He's already had smaller class sizes. He's already um, had to learn study skills without his, his parents looking over his shoulder. Ivy League schools now, I know it's different than when you were there 19 years ago, but Ivy League schools now, and maybe it's not different. So let me, let me say that, but wouldn't you be worried recruiting just to, even if he had great grades, great player, just a public school kid versus a kid who's been through the grind already? I mean, what are your thoughts on that? looking at it from a prep school coaching pers- or a Ivy League coaching perspective? Yeah, I definitely want to keep a broad perspective on, you know, categorizing all prep schools do this and all public schools do that. Because I, I think there are phenomenal high school programs out there. Um, the ones I recruit from. <laughs> so I know there's really good ones. But, you know, pound for pound, here's what I do know. I do know if you're playing in the NEPSAC, I know the competition you're going up against all the time. I know that you have more likely than not, you have a year round opportunity uh, right at that school. Um, you know, one of the things we have here that's incredible for our programs, our strength and conditioning. That's what most kids need coming to Exeter. I mean, they they already have academic chops coming in that, you know, put them in a, put them in a category that those colleges can recruit them. And I recruit really skilled kids. It's sort of a personal thing for the way we play. So the one thing they're usually missing is just physical development. You know, we get a lot of kids who are, who are just sort of, you know, they're malnourished. I like to tell them at that point when they get here, they're skinny. You know, the, the, the Duncans of the world, uh, that's kind of what he was coming in here. He was a division three hopeful for a lot of people coming into a post-grad year, you know? So we're recruiting a kid who's an un, who oftentimes is a little underdeveloped in, in a given area. It's usually their physical development. So we use, we use that, that as well. So, but the point is getting back to your question, Yes, I think if if you if I'm recruiting from a from a collegiate standpoint, I'm gonna go to the well where I know kids have had that opportunity to be in something that's that replicates a college experience, uh, and I think that's what a lot of these these NEPSAC schools that's that's what we're doing, and it's not just in basketball; we're doing a lot of sports. But you know, basketball happens to be it's just the hotbed for, for, for talent, for people are coming from all over the world now to, to New England. Mm-hmm. Uh, you look at New Hampshire alone, the, the, the talent level in prep school basketball in New Hampshire is incredible. It's incredible between the schools that we have here. I think, you know, uh, we could just play in state all year long. I don't know if we win any games, but we'd have, we'd have such incredible, um, talent to go up against in terms of you know mid high majors and just all the way down to really good division three kids in our our, in all of our programs here so yeah that's why i think college coaches at the end of the day they they're going to look for kids they know that have less of a learning curve Mm. not just athletically but all the other noise that goes along with being a freshman in college and that's what this place quiets that noise Right. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned Duncan Robinson there. Let's get into him a little bit because everyone that reaches out, well, not everyone, but probably half the kids that reach out to me say, hey, Corey, can you help me find a prep school so I can get a D1 scholarship and play in the NBA? So it's everyone's dream out there. And Duncan came in to you as a skinny kid. When he came to you for his post-grad year, was there anything you could have seen in the crystal ball of, of how he conducted himself or how he you know, practice or put time in the gym that gave you any inclination that he would one day end up in the NBA? Corey, truth be told, if I had that conversation back then, I think he'd have a better chance of getting his MBA than getting in the NBA. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's not a shot at him because he was a heck of a player even back then. But, you know, to, to think about what he has done is, you know, otherworldly and where he is. But, what he did have has always had as a passion to play. Um, and, you know, he says this now, and of course, now, now that he's there, I look back and say, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I can, I can see that. <laughs> he says this all the time now and in, in, um, referencing how he's able to get there. He stacks days together. That's his thing. Stack, you know, anyone can have a week, anyone can have a summer, you know, have, have a good month, but it's that consistent mental toughness, that approach that you take is where the improvement comes. And it's, 
it's, you know, I did this today. What's the next challenge tomorrow? And that was sort of his course. He took all along. He invested in himself, um, like a lot of these college level or college bound players are doing. Um, and just sort of, again, did a great job in the moment that he was in. Um, he did, when he came here, he just fully took advantage of where he was in the process at that given time and what was around him. Uh, you know, I, I, all the time I'm hearing people when it was at the end of his senior years, how do we miss on him? And they say, no, so, you know, I don't know that people really missed on him because at that given time, he was not, you know, he was not a big 10 level player. He had a lot of signs of, you know, being a six, what he was six, 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 seven back then he was fluid and he really, um, again, had that passion and he could shoot it. I really thought, I just loved his pace and how his feel for the game I thought was outstanding um, at that age level. But, you know, to, to say that his feet and his physicality were ever getting to the point where he could be a big time player in the NBA. I mean, that was kind of thing for all of us, something that was hard to look, look at, but sort of where he was at that moment and how well he managed his just his grind to the day without thinking, overthinking things was important. That's why he, he chose the path he did with Williams from the get-go. Um, that was a balanced approach for him again. You know, he, he really won that academic piece as well as the basketball. And that was part of sort of, I think the fabric of his, his family's influence clearly as well. Um, and that path that he's had, and I think he'll probably tell you now, if, if, if he didn't take all those steps to where he was, he probably wouldn't be where he is today you know it's not one of those was a regrettable move for him hey jane throughout this podcast we've had lots of guys on who've coached nba players and it's it's a consistent answer is they just grind every day and it's sometimes boring it's sometimes when they don't want to do it and they also have that little fire inside of them that i think you're just born with right yeah, he's a, he's always had that yeah um yeah. The other, i think the other thing he's always had too is he's Ex, you know, here, I think it's thrown around way too much, but he's exceptionally coachable. Like he, he will take information from anybody and process in a way that how does, how do I get better from this? Does he use all of it? No, but I think bits and pieces is probably what he's collected over time to be the best version of himself. You know, I think that's been a big part of it along the way is, you know, he's never put his, he's never got his, his nose out over his skis. You know, he's just been, in the moment, working hard and making the most of that situation. He did it here. He did it at Williams. He did it at Michigan. Sooner or later, you can't say this is, can you believe this is that for a while? I was like, yeah, I kind of can now. It's like right. Nothing surprises me because he just has a, a, there's a history behind it. Yeah. Last tough question here for you. Um, since you're a former D1 coach and since you've placed so many kids at that level, what advice or what, if you were king for a day of the NCAA, with everything going on right now, what changes would you make, if any? Gosh, you know, there's that's a really good question. I think there's some challenges ahead here. I, um, I, I think one thing that's going to have to be considered is, is how the NCAA takes a look at roster sizes, for one. Uh, the funding's a big piece. You know, I, I wish that you know, the old model used to – there used to be more um, – uh, JV teams and chances for kids to compete at a younger level collegiately, but a lot of those were eliminated. I, I think they're going to be faced with finding a way to um, certainly in the near future, because of the, the swell of available players right now, they're going to have to find a way to foster the younger players coming in. Um, I don't know what that looks like and how the funding component works, but I, the, the, it, it, it does, it, it's concerning right now in terms of how this bubble is going to, is going to be relieved at some point, you know, prep school is going to be a big help for these kids. Um, but you know, there, there's, again, you get this many kids in the transfer portal with, with no, um, there's no deterrent from jumping from one school to the next is, is hopefully just a temporary thing that's that is going to eventually alleviate itself. But I think that's one thing they have to take a look at right now. Um, and the next thing we have to, and I know it's pandemic related and safety is going to be number one, but sooner you're going to figure out a time. I think you're going to have to relax their uh, initial stance on how evaluation periods are, are able to, to come into play. Um, I think this fall, 
I'm hoping this summer gets us closer back to what, what we were at before, but I think they're going to have to be more creative in the modeling that's allowing coaches to, to get out and see kids, you know, in their high schools in the fall. It's going to be a big, I think it's going to be pretty, pretty important for everybody, you know, in the, in the coming months. Yeah. And you're the first person I've ever heard the JV proposal come from. And I think that's a great idea. And, you know, personally, I played in the Air Force JV program and that was a, you know, we could not have everyone on the varsity team there. They brought in guys that needed to develop. And there was plenty of good players that came out of that farm system we had at Air Force. And I know North Carolina has one. Kentucky had one with Patino back in the 90s. I don't know how many other teams have them, but I think that's a great idea. The question there would be, like what you mentioned is, are these kids all full scholarship? And if so, where's that money coming from? Yeah, North Carolina can do it. Kentucky can do it. But what about your low D1s? They, you know, Some of them can barely afford to have the current, you know, one more senior stay behind and have a roster of 15. So uh, that would be very you interesting. Know, usually the funding component always comes into play. But, you know, I think in, you know, even before the pandemic started to affect college recruiting, I always felt that, you know, too many kids were in a hurry to get there. Um, and I think if they could lengthen that out a bit, let's, you know, you could have a post-grad experience or whatever, that fifth year of school, somewhere along the line. And then you came in and, and, um, had an opportunity to just continue to develop in the moment and stretch that out a little bit more. Frankly, I think kids would benefit from it anyway, at the collegiate level as just as, you know, successful players. Um, is you're just playing, as you know, the, you, you, you come from high school or prep school, wherever you are, you're still playing against men who have been doing it in their college program for at least a couple of years, right? <laughs> who, are, yep. who are still ahead of you. Um, so the, as, as much as possible, if you can flatten that curve, that learning curve out, I think is it's only to the benefit of your long-term experience as a player. Yeah, no, that's good sharing. Uh, now we're getting in the quick hitter section of the podcast, Jay. So you probably uh, learn well, right now, as long winded I am, that quick hitting is not an easy task for me. So I'll see if I can measure up. They're quick questions. You can give as long answers as you want. So uh, what's your biggest win uh, ever as a coach? Biggest win ever? Yeah. Um, I'll probably, I'll have to go back to probably 2013, our first class A championship. Um, yeah, you know, it was just one win. I mean, you had to win three games in about five days here. So it feels like one game <laughs> in so many ways, but that was the first year that we, uh, we won our, our first, we won four in the last eight. So that kind of got the ball rolling. That was Duncan's year. And we had some good, good kids in that team. So 2000, I'll say 2013 championship game was our, was the, the springboard. Okay. Best player you ever coached against? Against? Um, oh gosh. Uh, Nerlens Noel was a little bit of a, uh, <laughs> tough one to handle. Uh, Noah Vonley was a, uh, it was pretty tough too. Um, I would say that those are two of the, the most talented we've we've gone up against um, physically. There's been I'll throw this out there too. There's so many really really tough physical Division three kids mm -hmm. play against in our league. Or you know they may not have the high ceiling physically, but they're a little bit closer to that physical ceiling and ahead of some of those other you know high flyers at the time that can really put it to you you know, at, at these schools. So this is some really, really good kids across the board. What's your favorite movie? My favorite movie, um, you know, I, I, some of the, the more recent classics. I mean, everyone loves Shawshank Redemption. That's always been a, a, favorite, of, a favorite of mine. I'll That's probably that. playing on TBS right now. By the way. And, and no kidding, no kidding. A lot of those, those uh, late night shows, it was always come up when basketball games is done, you're flipping through, you see that on there a lot. And it's, I always get stuck on it. Gotcha. How about uh, the most points you ever scored in a game? Most points I ever scored? Probably more memorable for how many I've given up, Corey, to be honest with you. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have been a good hockey goalie. Uh, most, but, uh, gosh, I don't even know. It's been so long since, since I since I played. Probably, you know, high 20s or so. Okay. And then I, I wasn't a big scorer. I was, I was definitely more of a facilitator in my time. Gotcha. And just, I'm going to tell everyone out there listening, Jay has shared with me a, a term, which I, it's just been burned in my brain. When he talked about his two-year-old son a few years ago, he said, it's like having a swarm of bees in my house. And I've now <laughs> got two young kids. And I just, that, that phrase always pops in my head. And I attribute that to you. And uh, <laughs> it's, 
So that, but that leads me to, to my last question. You're like, when you're not coaching, uh, what are your hobbies outside of basketball? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I think it's, it's parent, but I have a I have a six year old and seven next week. Um, so that's that's a big one. My wife and I live on campus and really fortunate to have that. This this place is for him, it's like club, club med. So anything that has to do with with parenting, which is so broad based on the real quick story for him is I, I had him at a workout, one of our like early morning lifts last year was like 6 30 in the morning i took them over to watch the kids lift and they all after the you know of course he loves our players after they jumped out to go i said kim and they, they got to go to class we got to get out of here and he, he looked at me he says where do they go to school he, he had no idea that this is a school <laughs> that, he, that these kids are here to have fun and had a great dining hall and play basketball and <laughs> you know so that's that was his vision of the of the environment that he's growing up in um so, you know, just having those mentors here. But so I think parenthood has, yeah, clearly been been a key one for me. I'm actually just honestly, I am a big coaching junkie. I love anything from running our tournaments that we do to just talking about with college coaches and, and uh, my, you know, my assistants are great. They're both older than me and have retired coaches who just are like a wealth of knowledge and the guys I can lean on. So Anything that has to do with just the culture surrounding basketball and development of our kids, it, it takes up most of my time. You know, I, I used to play golf, but I don't do that much anymore. now that I have a six-year-old at home. Yeah. Last, last question. I just thought is what's the best meal in the chow hall there? Well, I think it's depends on who you're, who you're chatting. I mean, I'm asking you, if you have, it's if they're going to be you, for, for me, uh, well, we actually absolutely every year. Now, this is this is not a regular occurrence, but there is a, a lobster feed every year that we do. I'm a huge seafood guy. We're right, we're nine miles from the Atlantic Ocean, so we are in the heart of where you get great seafood in the Northeast. So we do get that every year, and I don't, I never miss that meal. Perfect. Well, Jay, it was a pleasure having you on here. It's good seeing you again with uh, with uh, your new athletic facility there in the background. And I'll definitely be getting up there in the near future to, to see all the updates to campus. But um, thanks so much for sharing this information. I think you've got a lot of good stuff to share that people are going to appreciate. And um, I hope you guys stay safe up there and have a, uh, you know, a safe summer and a, a, all your kids come to campus next year and you get them all placed and you have a chance to win another title. This has been fun, Corey. Thanks for having me. And I continue to appreciate all you do for not just, just our program, but you've been instrumental in, in helping young men get to some of these great schools and start the springboard on their career. So great, you know, kudos to you, what you've been up to. And um, you're one of the good ones for the sport. So thanks so much for all you do and for having me today. I appreciate that. Thank you all for joining the, this episode with Coach Jay Tilton of the Phillips Exeter Academy uh, on this podcast episode. And if you like it, go ahead, subscribe and uh, make sure you don't miss any episodes in the future. So thanks so much for listening. We'll see you next time.